recap of this where we were last time. We spent a little bit of time at the end of the class last week before discussing the equations up here for P1 and P0, the slow and the intercept integration of mine. And I just want to quickly go back to where we were there when we were looking at that work. We had this we recall that we ended up with these equations with the horizon set of derivatives to zero. And a lot of our discussion at the end of the class was cracking the meaning of P1 as the ratio of the covariance between x and y, rather by the variance of x. And then P0 had a neat interpretation. Because it depends on P1 and x bar and y bar, recall that that emphasizes there that the regression line will pass through the point x bar and y bar. So that we're going to be, that's going to be an important point in today's class. Just stress what that means then. Okay, so if we talk about data and we put our regression line over there, that regression line will have this third point, is what I call it. So that third point x bar and y bar over there through which the regression line will pass. And exactly it will pass through that point, x bar and y bar. We'll be on that straight line that we're close to 1 and intercept B0. Now, today's class is focusing on judging that regression model. So, what is it? Analysis of variance in Five-minute word that many of you put down on those little pieces of paper right at the start of the class that you really want to understand what the analysis of variance is. You've seen A and OBA go over tables plenty of times in your second year with this that view. So analysis of variance, yeah? Hands up. Familiar with the term? I'm sure what it means. Okay. So today's class is all about analysis of variance and understanding what that word means and what we should take away from it. But if we're looking at analysis of variance, one thing that's important then, just to quickly recap, if a load of is our goal, then one thing we shouldn't understand is just that in variance. So let's quickly recap what a variance is. A variance is any variable amount of spread. And the way we quantify variance is by saying, let's take that variable, xi. So I have several values of the variable. And I'm going to subtract from it some average, x bar. So that will create deviations. And then we'll square the deviations so we get rid of the sign. And our next step is, once we have this, deviation variable. So think what these deviation variables are. It says take your raw data, subtract from the mean, and then square them. So at this point, before we go any further, you're going to have a whole lot of positive numbers. What is the smallest number that you'll have in that vector? Zero. And you'll have numbers that go from zero upwards. If you had to plot the distribution of those data, what should they look like? So the distribution, lower bound is going to be zero. You can't go further than that. But you're going to have lots of numbers that are close to zero, lots of numbers that are a little higher, lots of numbers that are higher still, so a roughly even spread. Like, but let me just calculate the average residual size. 
what you do then is say sum these up and divide it by n. Okay, so all that I've gone and done there by finishing up that is calculate the average residual size. So the variance then takes the residual, squares them, and then calculates the average. So let me be a little bit more precise from what I just said. It calculates the average squared residual size. And then what you'll see then, we'll call this term is the mean square, the mean value of the squares. <coughs> if you have a model, sorry, if, you, if your data points, xi, are all right next to the mean, and you'll have no residuals, all of those values will be exactly zero, and then your mean square is zero. That's the smallest <coughs> amount of variance you can have, there's no variance of zero. And then you go higher and higher from that point. So analysis of variance is going to break down where our variability is. So that's what I hope to explain to you today's class. Let's, uh, let's take a look at this one other way before we get going. What does a plot look like, a regression model look like, I should say, with r squared equal to 1? Draw it on a piece of paper. What are you going to see? R squared equals 1. The worst 
well, that you can possibly have is where your prediction is simply the average y. Now, I've fit many models like this before. I've worked with company data where that was actually the best model we could, could, could come up with. You're asking me what is the best predictive value you can tell me. The best prediction I can give you is the average y. Because there's no structure to the data. There's no formal structure to the data, so the best prediction I can give you for y is the average y in the data that I've used to build the model. Okay, so that's a valid model. I'll argue this is a valid model, and I'm going to show you that this model has r squared equals zero. There's many other models that can give you r squared equals zero. I can show you a few of those later on. But every other case is going to fall between these two extremes. And all that analysis of variance does is it tells you if you're on the left-hand side, on the right-hand side, or where you are in the middle. That's really all you get from analysis of various tables. And a bit more, but the majority of the information is that. So let's take a look at how we get that. Well, let's step back a bit. We're going to step back and look at what it means by signal and noise and how we can quantify the well, Noise, then, is error. We'll take that as an implicit assumption that when you have noise in our data, we'll call it error. It's, in other words, it's the part of the data we cannot extract. And we'll sometimes refer to that simply as a residuals. There's a part of the data we can explain, the systematic data, and that's the signal. So you take a raw data set, Think of your raw data that you get from your lab measurement, from your process when you go to your chemical plant. You can take that data and you can break it down into two pieces. The parts you can explain and the parts you cannot explain. Noise and signal. So one way to see this is we know that we've seen this sort of illustration that I showed you a few classes back. We said that I kind of wish life was like that, that everything was with beautiful flat lines, but we also said at the same time, if life really were like that, none of us would have jobs. We wouldn't be employed, there'd be no reason for chemical engineers if life was flat line. It would be pretty uninteresting. Like we would set our processes running, there would be a few stuff for us to walk away. But life isn't like that, there's always variability, and let's understand what that variability does. So there's there's the baseline. When you talk about variability, you always have a baseline. And that baseline is quite straightforward because remember when we said what is the definition of variance? Let's go back to that equation for variance. Variance said take your raw data minus x bar. That's your baseline. Now I can replace x with y. So I can call this y i minus y bar. So whenever we calculate variance, we're doing it relative to some baseline. And my baseline is always explicitly mentioned over there. And then I go calculate the mean of those sums and squares. So the baseline model, the worst case model, then is the model where we do nothing. And that says your best prediction of y is the intercept, which is the average one. So that's doing nothing. Then you can go say, well, I can do a little bit better than that. If there's signal in my data, if there's structure, I can go fit a slope. So add a slope to my model. And now I can improve things and improve my prediction. Another way of judging this baseline model that I have over here on the left on the blackboard simply recognizing that E1 is equal to 0. You've got no slope. Only an intercept of E0. So when we look at next now as analysis of variance, remember there's a baseline against which we're going to judge things. And that's going to be our important, important frame of reference. So let's take a look at this picture to understand the analysis. I'm only showing you one data point for this explanation, and it will hold for any data point. But let's take a look. Let's say there's my one data point, and presume there were several others that I had used, and 
and I used those data and I found this regression line. So there's my slope B0, sorry, B1 to my slope, and my intercept over there is B0. That's my regression line. And notice my regression line passes through the point x bar y by definition. It said that it's slow in class today. So there's my regression line. And notice the next important point. There's my baseline, y bar, that I'm just referring to. So if I showed you all my raw data, I don't have them here, but if I showed it to you, the average y value would be along this point of the y-axis and y bar. Now we've got that baseline. Let's calculate several numbers. The first one we'll call the total sum of squares, the total deviation. And what we do there is say there's my raw data point. It's got an xi coordinate here on the x-axis, and it's got a yi coordinate on the y-axis. The total sum of squares refers to this distance from the raw data point y to the baseline. We're going to square them in a minute. But the total distance is made up of that vector. We can break that vector down into two parts. The part I can explain due to the model, and the part I cannot explain due to the error. So that total length, forget the SS part right now, simply so look at the total length. The total length can be broken into two parts, the regression portion and the residual portion. The regression portion says, what does it take to get from my baseline this worst possible prediction, y bar? What does it take to get from that baseline to the regression? Because if you have to make a prediction in the future, I make a prediction for that x value, the best prediction you can give someone is not y bar, but it's y bar plus some incremental amount. And that incremental distance is the distance to get to the regression. So your best y hat, notice here's the new terminology y hat, your best prediction of y at this value of xi is that value of yi. That value of y hat is a certain distance away from your baseline given by that delta <coughs> in my context. So we call that the regression distance. But that my raw data isn't actually on that, on that line. My raw data point is a little bit further away. It's over there at yi, so we call that distance the residual distance. So that distance would be very comfortable. We've seen that uh, in the last class and the class before that. So the regression distance is down here, and the residual distance is up there. You can always take a point, a raw data point, yi, xi, and break it down into two parts, the regression part plus the residual part, sum them up and you get the total. And that's true whether the point is above the line, below the line, on the line, always adds up in that way. So let me take that and express it mathematically. For those of you that like the geometric picture, there it is. Let's take a look at that mathematically. This first expression there says calculate the total distance from my raw data point y to the average y. So that's the total distance. That distance is broken down into the regression portion, so if you predict y by hat, minus your baseline y bar. There's also the residual portion, this RSS portion, and that's y i, the actual data point, minus the prediction. Sum those two up, and you get the total portion. And as I said before, that distance works whether you're above the line or below the line. So that's the first equation. Now let's take that first line and square the left-hand side and square the right-hand side. If you do a little bit of algebra and expand that right-hand side, it takes a little bit more work, but you can get that expansion over there in the second equation. The third equation is a little bit of a simplification of the first I've rearranged. But also what I've done is, I said, here I've written the second equation is for one data point, xi, and one data point below. The third line says, well, let's write out these for every single data point. I have n data points in my data set. 
So I can write that out every single one of those data points and sum up over them. And what we will get then is essentially what we call the total sum of squares. So every data point I take this distance, square it, and sum them, and I get the total sum of squares. So total sum of squares is a number that's always above zero and it's always extremely large. So think of what that's saying. Look at that formula over there. It says take your raw data y, subtract the y average, square it, and sum them. Notice that that term over there on the left hand side is pretty much exactly the variance. Everything except dividing through by n. So total sum of squares literally is your variance multiplied by n. It's another way to submit it. Take your variance, multiply it by n, and get your total sum of squares. It's a large, large number. And all that analysis of variance does, and I'm going to show this, you're going to show it to yourselves actually, is it breaks down that sum of squares. Now, think of what that is. That's a positive number. It's the distance of squared. And it's going to break it down into two pieces. Either the part you can predict by regression, or the part due to the residuals. So we're going to do this in a table form, because that's the most easiest way to take this total and break it down into the two parts that make it up. Anyone unclear on either this geometric picture down here or the algebraic representation of the part? Any questions or doubts? Now let's take a look at and actually see your understanding. Go ahead and I would like you to consider two hypothetical cases. I would like you to consider this case that I've got over here on the left hand side. And for any data set, so here's one particular data set, that you make up a data set, give me a rough idea of what the regression sum of squares would equal for this sort of situation, what RSS would equal for that situation, and what TSS would equal for that situation. So give me rough estimates of what those three values would be for this situation. And then repeat that exercise with the person next to you for this situation where you've got a perfect model. Okay, so go ahead and discuss that. Figure out what those six values might look like for those two very extreme cases.
for the regression sum of squares for this worst case. This first value over here for this bad, bad case, what would you be? Yeah, can everyone see that? So that's zero for that situation. Because for the worst case, the regression sum of squares is predicted y minus the average y. Well, the predicted y for this worst case situation is just the average y, y bar. So it's y bar minus y bar. No matter how many times you sum up zero, we still get that. What's RSS for that case? Let's take your raw data point minus the predicted y. Well, the predicted y is the average y. So take that distance, square it. Take the next distance, square it. Take the next distance, square it. So adding up all these distances squared. All right. What does that look like? That's just like we did earlier when we added up our residual here. Right. So the regression, the residual sum of squares is just, let's just write it here, some large number. Okay. And what is the TSS? The same large number. Okay. So the same Same large value. Take a look now at the best case situation. What is the regression sum of squares? The zero for the regression sum of squares. It's a large number again. Notice 
finished. Well, I'm lying to you. X's are in there because they're in there through Y hat. So to get the predicted Y, you need to know where you are, which is you need to know where X is. But what I'm going to start to lead you down to the realization is that R squared can actually be calculated without even filling a regression model. Okay. So that, that's the part that really should kind of throw you. Because how can you be using a number to judge the quality of a model when you can calculate the number without filling the model? Okay, so we're going to start to see that become apparent, but what I wanted to get from this discussion now is recognizing that R squared simply tells you if you're over on the left or if you're over on the right, or somewhere in between. So let's, uh, let's just formalize that a little bit. Uh, we've done the generic plot and created in the open system. The value is you've written down that ratio, regression sum of squares over 12 sum of squares. And we learned then that if we've got no model, in other words, we just have our baseline, my bar, that that ratio is zero. We have the case with perfect predictions, that ratio is 1, and we call that ratio R squared for short term. So there's the, there's the substitution of regression sum squares in by the total sum squares. So you don't get cancellation quite, quite like you might expect. But it is simply a ratio of what you can explain divided by what you start with. So R squared is a ratio of what you can explain divided by where you start. It's total sum of squares. Now you can also express, because total sum of squares is related to the regression sum of squares, what you can predict with the regression model plus what is left over in the residuals, that's a, that's a rule, that expression. So if you substitute in that, into that formula, you can find a slightly different interpretation. R squared can also be interpreted as 1, in other words, you have a perfect explanation, minus what's left over divided by what you started with. And if what's left over is nothing, in other words, you have a perfect prediction is nothing left over, then that term drops away, and then it's just 1. Conversely, if what's left over is exactly what you started off with, TSS is equal to RSS. What's left over is what you started off with. You've got no further ahead, in other words. In other words, you've got no further than fitting a horizontal line. Then R squared is equal to zero. So I'd like you to have those two extremes in your mind when you think of R squared going forward. Now, this is the, where I was talking about R squared. It's a problem that we sometimes face. If you take a look at this formula, Back, right back to correlation. We started the section looking at correlation. Correlation, we said, was defined as the covariance of x with y divided by the variance of x multiplied by the variance of y when you take the square root of that. We don't, we don't have a nice short name for that you know. But the numerator we call covariance. So there's lowercase r. And if we square it, we get what we get called by convention R squared capitalized. And I was telling my class last year, I was looking at this formula, and it's like, oh, hang on, there's no model. Look at that. It simply says, take your raw data x, your raw data y, calculate the covariance. That's easy. It's one line in R. Then calculate your variance of x, your variance of y, calculate that as well. Find and take the square root. You've not calculated any slope. You want, you've not filtered any intercept to be zero. Yet you end up with R squared. So this is where you should see the shortcoming of what R squared is. R squared is never a good judge of a model's predictive capability because you've not calculated a model yet. All that R squared is is telling you how correlated two variables are. Because R squared is simply the correlation of the squared. So all that R squared is is the correlation between the x and y. So if those two variables are tightly correlated, you'll get a good model. But R squared isn't a 
which should not be used as a way to tell whether you've got it or not. R squared its only utility is to calculate the relationship or the correlation between two variables. If they happen to be tightly correlated, that's great, you can get a good model, but that's not what R squared's intention is. The other reason why R squared isn't a good measure of the model's predictive ability is because nowhere have we measured or judged its predictive capacity. The only way we can measure and guarantee predictive capacity of a model is by doing tests where we leave our data, rebuild the model, see how the model performs on the data that we left out. And if we repeat that over and over, you may have heard the term cross-validation, and that's what cross-validation is. It says build your model, say with 80% of your data, leave 20% aside, test the model on those 20%, and see how well the model did. And you repeat that whole process again, leaving another 20% out, again, 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 a few times, and that's a good way to check the model's predictive capacity. Okay. But simply using R squared to tell that this is a good predictive model, is not suitable. Okay, so I'll just put it, put it there. Yeah, telling how good a model is for particular purpose is almost never a negative R squared. You will burn yourself if you get a model with good R squared and say, I'm going to use this model to predict something about my process. Because what you will find is unless you've tested that model thoroughly, that your predictions will have substantial error. So we'll, we'll show you how to do that next. And to do that, what we rather use is a metric called the standard error. So you've looked at analysis of variance in your second year course, or third year course. And in those analysis of variance tables printed out by Minitab, how many of you recall the standard error being there in the body? You may not remember it there, but it might be there as SE or standard error, but there's, it usually appears in there as an output, and I'm going to try and convince you that that's a more suitable metric of the model's predictive capacity. Or, um, yeah, we'll, and I'll show you how to use it to judge the predictive capacity. So at this point, then, it's a good idea to switch to some software tools. I'll just quickly show and demonstrate that to you. So I have a vector x and I have a vector y over the vector r. And this is the data set that's in your slides a few slides back. Uh, let's just take a look here. It will be this slide number 33. Now I recommend you to use the data that's here on slide 33 to calculate the slope and intercept. Because in the test of exam, this would be how I present the data to you so you can get the slope and intercept. So maybe actually let's do that as a, as a good exercise. Take a minute or two and calculate what the slope and the intercept B0 and B1 might be from that data, given those means and those variances and those variances.
in this situation, we can visually see the data are positively correlated, so we know our slope coefficient E1 must be positive. So the part of the raw data is shown here. Anyone got the intercept, sorry, the slope? Given the definition of the ratio of the variance and the covariance for the, for the slope. So let's take a look at that. If you have the previous slide, you can see that the slope E1 is equal to the ratio of the covariance, x minus x bar, y minus y bar, is divided through by a term that's related to the variance of x. So that numerator there for the total is equal to 110. Sorry, is equal to 55. And then the intercept is obtained by using this relationship that the intercept is equal to the average y minus e1 times average x. We need to calculate e1 first and then. So that's uh, how to do it by hand. Um, let's take a look in the R software. So we're looking at this for assignments and practice how to use and read the analysis of various table. You follow the following process. So this is published on the website as one of the learning um, modules for the software. So what I'll, I'll do is I've got the data cleaning of the case and y. And what I did was I had said, just what you see it back here earlier, y is equal to c. So c is the operator in R that tells you to combine values. So combine the values 10, 8, etc. into a vector and call that vector x. That operator that is called the assignment operator. So we're assigning that vector to x, and then we assign the vector y in a similar manner. So there's my raw data that's assigned to y. And then plot x, y, your set plot x, y, and that generated the plot uh, that we had earlier. I don't have the space here on the small screen. But there it is. Summary and on model of LS. 
we'll get a little bit more of a complete summary. So everything pretty much down here on the screen now is the new output that we have to summarize in this. You'll get this sort of summary from Minitab, you'll get this from SAS, SAS, Jump, any commercial statistics package will output some, something similar to this. So we see the first two things repeated back to us. There's my intersect of 3 and my slope of 0.5. R squared is available to you over here. So there's multiple R squared, 0.6665 is your R squared value. And we're going to learn about standard error. So R prints that out on the line above it, 1.237. And there's 9 We'll talk a bit about the degrees of freedom next time. There's a residual to get a summary of the residuals. There's a minimum, median, and maximum. And I'll the other five points over there. And then also, our focus next class is going to be on the standard error related to the scope of the test. Those we're going to use to understand and uncover what are the confidence intervals between zero and one. Well, oh, sorry, I should say beta zero, we're going to get an upper bound and a lower bound, beta zero and beta one. And those bounds are related to these numbers there, uh, next to the slope of the Okay, so the key thing we need for this is the standard error, R squared, the degrees of freedom, 